you know, to be a brand that stands out today, you have to be willing to be polarizing. Yes. You have to be willing to push people away and you have to take a stand for something. I mean, the vanilla brands are just swept up in that sea of sameness. So, I, you know, whoever gave you that advice, like never talk to them again. Like, <laughs> Take them out of your phone. That's the yeah. worst advice I've ever heard. I mean, <laughs> if you were to be performing a character and this was not authentic to you, maybe I would agree. But yeah, yeah, yeah. This is course. clearly a part of you. And I think yeah. for anybody listening, you have to be willing to push people away to to magnetize the people that are the best fit for you. You're mm. never going to build an iconic, unforgettable brand trying to be safe and playing, oh, you know, yeah. playing to everyone. Yeah, and there's another people that, you know, that I remember or that I look up to, you know. So, you know, I love people who are just really just strong and just themselves and just say it like it is. I love it. I'm just like, this is so funny. This is great. Welcome back. We are on today with my guest, Rachel K. Albert on Amtool for This Shit podcast. I'm Angie S. and I guess I'm told to take any kind of shit now. If you haven't heard about me, I'm Angie S., the founder of Angie S.com. That's Angie S.com. Links in the show notes. Where I coach and consult women on their health and skincare, was keeping it fun, irreverent, and most of all, practical and realistic to their own lifestyles. I started this podcast because I wanted to talk about well-being beyond food, skincare, and meditation. I wanted to have guests on who can share their wisdom on sex, dating, health, relationships, and misfits. Basically, all of the things that I'm excited and curious about and have also experienced the ups and downs of. So today is actually really around being yourself fully in whatever you decide to do in your life. Rachel is a misfit in the traditional business and marketing world. And when I say a misfit, it's an absolute compliment to her work. It is why she is winning. I think the takeaways from this episode can be applied in many areas of your life, whether it be your work, who you date, how you date, how you get down. Just be you 100%. Don't be a copycat. Just be you. I absolutely love her. She had the balls of fire to go with her creativity and all her crazy videos are actually informational. She marries being funny and of substance so well. So a little announcement, going forward, I don't intend to do business-centric episodes anymore unless someone really stands out like Rachel as a misfit, quirky, and truly empowering to others to be themselves, which in my opinion, Rachel is and does. So... Without further ado, welcome, Rachel. Oh my goodness gracious, great balls of fire, I'm here. (laughs) Thank you so much for joining me today. I'm really, really excited to have you on. You're just very, very funny. I, what I love about you and why I brought you on is because you make marketing and business, like online businesses, honest and fun. And you just have this crazy, honest, upbeat vibe, so full of energy that I just really love. So anyone who's listening who don't know Rachel, wait till the end of the episode, but I really encourage you to go watch her videos. She's everywhere, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram. Rachel, please introduce yourself, where you live and what you do. Well, I'm super pumped to be here and thank you for the kind words. I'm going to pass them along to my mom because (laughs) she's, this is who I do it all for. It's all for mom. Yeah, I'm Rachel K. Albers and I am a designer, content strategist and business comedian. Um, I run a branding and web design agency, RKA Inc. And then I'm also the host of a business comedy show called Awkward Marketing, which brings together sketch comedy and storytelling to help businesses create epic, unforgettable brands online. They're not like sort of like traditional how-to videos. Can you tell us a little, tell us a little bit about them? Yes. So for anybody who under, who knows the show Saturday Night Live, which is a big sketch comedy show that's been going on for 30 years, uh, you know, 30 plus years in the US. I like to say I am the one woman Saturday Night Live of business comedy because the show is little sketch comedy vignettes that are kind of bringing to life all of the different awkward, uncomfortable, difficult, challenging marketing situations that business owners face 
And then I barrel in RKA to teach people, you know, how to market their businesses, just like you said, in an honest, real way to have fun with it, push through the awkwardness and create something awesome. So I've got, at this point, I probably have about 60 plus wigs and I'm looking at a (laughs) wall of wigs right now in my, in my, uh, studio. I'm right outside of my video studio. And so I'm here to take on any, you know, any and every character that you could ever imagine to teach about marketing. Those of you who who haven't seen her videos yet, basically like your videos, they're all characters and they're just hilarious. You've got anything from like the mom, from the braggy, braggy bro, but I can't say ours in English. I'm going to have to say braggy dude. Yeah. It's just, it's just fantastic. How did you, how did you get started into that? Do you have a background in stand up? Isn't that something like that? I have a background in theater and Uh comedy. Yes. I'm new to the stand-up scene, actually. I haven't been doing it as long as I've been in the in the performing world. But yeah, I have this... I've been performing as long as... I mean, as, as soon as I could talk, I was performing. But in my early 20s, I kind of left that world behind. And, you know, I went to law school. I, then I started a business and didn't really think that I was going to keep that. I, I mean, I, I kind of said goodbye to it like an old lover. I was like, okay, we're parting ways. It's, you know... And then, you know, a couple years ago, found a way to weave it back into my business. And it was like this wonderful surprise, you know, like Mm. me and this old lover got back together and it was the most wonderful, delightful reunion ever. Um, But I never planned it. It just, it kind of happened. And the, the, the way that awkward marketing started was very awkward. It used to be a Facebook live show where I would hop onto Facebook live every week, talk about marketing for 20 minutes and Then it evolved into, you know, trying some different, more gutsy, fun stuff that kind of pointed me in the direction of, oh, okay, wait, 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 wait. I can bring the theater side of myself into creating content for people because the best thing you can do with your content is to be entertaining while you're educating people, right? So I stumbled into it. No, I love it. It's, it's fantastic. I mean, this is funny because some of the stuff that you come up with, I've been wondering if like, this is going to sound weird, but because some of the stuff you say are funny and they're funny because they're so spot on. It feels like you got into a, like a pyramid scheme by mistake and like got loads of inspiration in that company, you know, that you got like drawn in and then you got out just right in time. You know, that's how it feels like. Cause like some of the stuff is just so, so real, you know? Yeah. You know, I think sometimes people are like, oh, do you wish you had done this show sooner? Because I, you know, I had been in business for eight years when I started creating this content that really changed the game for my business. But I could not have done it a moment sooner because it took me about eight years of being immersed in the online marketing world to, you know, collect these observations. And like you said, you know, I, it's like, I feel like the online marketing world can be very much like a pyramid scheme. Mm-hmm. And so I just spent all this time simmering and stewing in it and, and, you know, watching all this crazy stuff go down until finally it all kind of converged and I have a ton of material. Um, so I couldn't have done this any earlier than I did it because I needed that time to kind of really soak in how this industry works so I could create these sketches. Mm, yeah, no, that makes sense. It makes total sense. The we got to we're, we're definitely going to uh, talk and dive into a little bit about you know sort of how you see marketing and online business and how to not make it so yeah so like stiff and boring or or sleazy or guilt tripping. But just before we do that, and I think because that's kind of important, it's an important part of marketing when you, when you know when we have online businesses is how how did you make that jump from like getting these ideas to just owning it to owning these characters that you portray in the videos and I mean I'm just guessing here because I, I I don't know you'd have to tell me but to me it seems like it was it was a risky move for you to do those like videos all these different characters were you ever worried that you would be taken seriously uh, and I'm, I'm asking this but I, I know that this has probably given you loads of business because that to me that's what attracted me to you with those crazy videos I absolutely love them they, they make me laugh so how did you just own it? What was the thing? And were you ever worried not to be taken seriously? Oh, totally. And it took me a really long time to embrace comedy and fun in my brand. Um, I think it was maybe four or five years ago that I met, it's a mutual, uh, you know, colleague that we both 
admire Ash Amberge. We did a little consulting. Oh, yeah. Call. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I w- she was helping me redo my tagline because at the time, the tagline for my business was web design with heart. And I oh, was no, all no, it. no. Can you it wasn't. believe it? <laughs> I love it. What was I thinking, right? So wait, my, my previous name was the hybrid hippie. So, I mean. Oh my gosh, it's the same vein. Yeah, it was just like, yeah. I go, let's go. I want to so, hear this story. So I come to her and I'm like, listen, this tagline is not working. And so we have this consulting call and she's like, you know what? Girl, you are so fun. You are so funny. Why is that not a part of your brand? I'm like, funny, what? No, I could never make that a part of my brand. And it took me a couple of years yeah. to for that light bulb to really go off because, yeah, I think I spent you know the first maybe five, six years of my business kind of performing a character, speaking of characters, a character of myself to, I don't know, try to be what other people wanted or, or you know, to... to have people perceive me in a certain way. And I had, you know, I think a lot of people go through that when you're creating a brand, it's really hard to figure out where do I combine these parts of my personality and what the market wants. And so we all go through that awkward, you know, growing pain of figuring out how we're going to show up in the world as businesses. And if you're building a personal brand as a personal brand, if you will, Um, (laughs) yeah. And then I started doing the Facebook live show and, you know, I, the, the funny thing is I was terrified to get on video, which a lot of people, you know, they're, they're shocked by that now because I just go all the way with the videos I do know about. I was so terrified. Um, but I kind of just showed up and decided to be myself. And the more I was just myself, I realized I was super awkward and weird and funny and funky and people were resonating with that. So I started kind of like notching it up. My first uh, awkward marketing esque video um, was I did a live musical. I did something called Facebook Live the Musical. Got on Facebook Live and did a like wrote a musical and sang it live for my audience, and people loved it. It took off, and that was the first signal to me that I was like, "Wait a minute, this kind of fun approach." to content is what people really like. So then I did a little experiment for Halloween. I think it was, gosh, it was two years ago. So it wasn't even that long ago for Halloween 2017. I created my top five awkward marketing characters. And that's when I got my green screen and a bunch of wigs. And I, I created these characters and did a bunch of videos and they were a smash hit. And that's what made me see, okay, people like this and they actually do take me seriously. And I'm going to, that's, that's when I decided to make the whole format of the show at the time, what I kind of envisioned it was like a marketing variety show. Um, and then it became like a sketch comedy show. So yeah, I mean, it did take me some time to live into that, which is really funny because I, I'm an extrovert and a performer and an entertainer. That's my whole background. But it was still very uncomfortable for me to bring those things into my business. Well, yeah, well, yeah, but that's because it's different from going on stage and reading someone else's words, like, or saying someone else's words in the play, right. to actually, this is you on the line. That's you know, it's not the same thing. You could be, you're still, you're using all those skills, but the stakes are much, much higher because this is your potential life, like future livelihood. Like you know, when you just start, you, you're trying it out, but it's scary because this is you. You can't hide behind, oh yeah, you know, Shakespeare wrote it or whatever, you know, it's just, it's you, you wrote it. It's very different. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. And that ends up being the part of it that if I could go back and talk to my 18 year old self, first of all, my 18 year old self would be super disappointed that this is how I I ended up being an actress, right? Like, because I (laughs) wanted to be on Broadway or like an Academy Award or something. Um, but now that I'm, you know, 35 and doing this, it's like the, the job of my dreams because of exactly what you just said, because I get to write it and I get to perform it and I get to produce it and I get to design it. And I get to do all these things that as an actor, you don't normally get to do because you're reading someone else's words and you're following someone else's direction. So that ended up, ends up being the most fun part of this. Mm. Yes, it's very scary. And it was definitely at first. But the best part of this is that I do have all of these ways of expressing my creativity within my business. So it's like yeah. a dream come true. Without, but it's like a nightmare come true if you asked me 20 years ago. 
<laughs> yeah, well, yeah, because we, you know, when we're like 18 and you know, what's the expression? Like dewy eyes, like just naive, and mm-hmm. you're like, you know, you're seeing the world in one way. You're like, what do you mean? I'm not having, you know, receiving an Oscar. It's, <laughs> you know, it's, uh, yeah, no, I think it's fantastic. And, you know, it really shows that everything that you've done is really helping you now. Like it's, it's all coming, to, it's all coming together. It's funny because, you know, you were saying like how you, you went to Ashambaji, like we have someone else in common, like, you know, Sarah from Public Persona. She's the one who gave me the confidence to just be me because in the health industry, everything is so stale. You know, well, it's like not everything, but a lot of people are, you know, a certain way. And I, and I wanted to, you know, I wanted to be, I had all these ideas of, you know, I just want to be more myself. And she gave me the confidence and put it all together, helped me putting it together. So yeah, sometimes you just need someone to tell you, wait, why don't you do it this way? This is okay. Exactly. And mm. yeah, when I saw your branding that you did with, you know, some creative direction from Sarah years ago, I never forgot it. I, I love how you <laughs> are sticking out like a sore thumb in your industry, but in the best possible way. So, <laughs> you know, it's because I was told recently that uh, maybe I should do it a bit less, like, I was like, oh, you mean like less clowny? And the person was like, yeah. And I was, and actually I thought about it. I was like, you know what? No, <laughs> that's, no. Not, that's not me. I want to express myself and I'm still holding back. I like, I, I mean, I really, this is, this, you know, this is why I'm, I'm, I'm really happy I have you on today because I feel like you're almost like the next step where I want to go to in the sense that you are just, I mean, your character is just going full out and I just want to completely just let loose, you know? And, but yeah, I think it's, it's awesome. And I think it's great that you are sort of carving the way for, yeah, people who just want to just add character and, and flavor to, to their business, you know, their personal brand. So yeah, nice. Yeah. And you know what, this actually, to circle back to Ash Ambergé, she gave me a lot of confidence. She, she writes a lot about you, you know, to be a brand that stands out today, you have to be willing to be polarizing. Yes. You have to be willing to push people away and you have to take a stand for something. I mean, the vanilla brands are just swept up in that sea of sameness. So, I, you know, whoever gave you that advice, like never talk to them again. Like <laughs> take them out of your phone. That's the yeah. worst advice I've ever heard. I mean, <laughs> if you were to be performing a character and this was not authentic to you, Maybe I would agree, but yeah, yeah, yeah. This is clearly a part of you, and I think yeah. for anybody listening, you have to be willing to push people away to to magnetize the people that are the best fit for you. You're mm. never going to build an iconic, unforgettable brand trying to be safe and playing, oh, you know, yeah. playing to everyone. Yeah, and there's another people that you know that I remember or that I look up to, you know. So you know, I love people who are just really just strong and just themselves and just say like it is. I love it. I'm just like, this is so funny. This is great. So, okay. So I want to talk a bit about marketing. So how, how to not be awkward <laughs> and how to avoid it. And I looked at, uh, I looked at your videos and the two of them sort of like stood out in terms of you have like the popularity game on Instagram. Then you have the marketing guilt trip, which is like the mom character who's trying to make you feel guilty not to buy her product, not to sign up. Mm-hmm. And then the other one was the, the Brad, the braggy bro, which is like, you know, he's, he lives in a palace. You, you're going to work four hours, four hours a week and you're going to be a multimillionaire. So <laughs> if someone has their, their own business and they need to go out there into sales and marketing, what would you say to someone to not be awkward and how to avoid it? I think one of the hallmarks for me of awkward slash awful marketing is this kind of copy and paste templated approach. Brad, the braggy bro who you mentioned is, <laughs> he is so this, like the front and center leading the way on this um, because he will have you believe that you're just one funnel away. All you need is his secret formula to make a bazillion dollars overnight. And so you have all these people who, I mean, it's a common thing. I mean, it's an understandable thing. Marketing is a long game. So, and it's painful and it's, it takes a lot of work. And I think a lot of business owners 
think about it as like, okay, I'm just going to do marketing really quick. And then I can get back to the most important thing in my business. And when they realize, oh no, marketing is an ongoing thing that I always have to be doing. They get overwhelmed and frustrated and stressed out. So then they want to believe in this, you know, magic pill that someone else is selling them like, oh, just copy this, just swipe my, you know, this, uh, that will take them to the top quickly. Um, and so that, you know, we've got all these people who are just hanging on the word of these iconic marketers and, and copying what they're doing. And that's what's like creating this massive explosion of awkward marketing um, is this copycat culture. So I think the first thing is to realize, and this is a painful realization, that marketing never ends. It is, it's not, and, and this should give people some relief. It's not that anyone out there has some secret that you just don't know yet that you need to spend $5,000, $50,000 to, to learn. People come to me as a branding person and they think, okay, I'm going to spend X amount of money with RKA and she's got some sort of, you know, she knows something I don't know. And she's going to take me from zero to a hundred overnight. And that's not true. And a lot of what I do on my show is to, to you know, educate people that even someone like me, I'm not a magic pill. There is no magic pill. So if you're ever feeling that feeling of FOMO of like, oh God, I got to do this program. I got to hire this coach. I got to take this course because they know something I don't know. And this is what's standing in the way between me and success. That's not true. So you don't have Mm. to spend your money that way. And that's, I think one of the number one things I would say to anybody who's looking to market their business. Yeah. I mean, I've come across you know, a few years back when I first started all this, I, I've come across these people where it's like, you just got to do what I do and you'll be fine. And you just have to give me 10,000 pounds for one month. And I'd be like, did you not just hear I'm starting out? Like, it's just, you know, they all don't, almost they don't have that foot in reality. You know, if someone's starting out, they're not going to, I mean, unless they have like loads of money already from other businesses, but when you're starting out and it's like a side hustle and you have a full-time job, you, I mean, not everyone's going to have all these crazy amounts of money to give you for your magic pill. And often I'd come away sometimes from certain calls feeling really deflated because, and I didn't really know why. And I think it's because there is something that isn't really real. You can tell when someone, there is like a lack of honesty and they're just trying to pull the wool over your eyes to make them sound so amazing so that you come in and give them the money. And of course, they're going to be financially successful because they're charging these crazy amounts, but there's no guarantee they're really even doing anything worth that, your time and energy and money. So I think there is a lot of, there are scammers out there, you know, I think people have to be careful, especially that feeling of, oh, I must have that, you know, I must join this course, I must join that, you know. Uh, if it's riddled with, you know, only I can do it, only I can make you, you know, it's, um, I don't know what your thoughts on that are. Yeah, I think that one of the hallmarks of a scammer, and this is not new, um, these types of sales techniques have been around forever, but the hallmark of a scammer really is someone that isn't paying attention to your situation right now. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was in an event a while ago that was selling like a high ticket, program and it cost upwards of $10,000. And on the application form, they had a box to check, like, what's your revenue for the year? And the first box was under $30,000. And I was like, wait a minute, you're going to let people into your $10,000 plus program who are making less than $30,000? To me, that's unethical. And so if somebody is on a call with you or pitching you a program and they know that you're just getting started and they're still pushing you and saying, oh, you know, you, if you really cared about your business, you would remortgage your house. You'd take out a loan, you'd get a credit card, you'd ask for a friend to help you, you mm. know, whatever. Mm. Yeah. That's something that I do. Like I regularly am on sales calls where within 15 minutes, I will tell the person, you are not ready to hire me. And certainly, you know, I could sell you this thing I don't think it would be completely worthless to you, but the reality is you're not going to see that money come back to you right away. So I don't think this is a good fit right now. And what I recommend you do is X, Y, Z first. I, that's one of kind of the cornerstones of how I do business is not taking on people who aren't going to see their money come right back to them. And sometimes I joke, like, this is why I'm not a millionaire, because if I just had to know... (laughs) 
integrity, I could just be selling people stuff that isn't really yeah. going to serve them. Um, but yeah, I think that's, that's really, you know, a good indicator if you're working with someone that is going to be aligned with, with your, with your business's goals and where you're at. If they're selling you something that they know you can't afford and they're still pushing the, the sale really hard, walk mm. away super fast, you know? Oh, I, I, I'll tell you one thing I've had once is, it, it was a call and it's a, a discovery call, you know, like you don't know the price. And the amount the person was, ask, was asking for at the end, for results that are intangible, you cannot, there's a not, it's not like as if you can say, if you hire someone to do your Facebook ads, you can see the return on investment. There's something measurable, a bit more measurable. This is not as measurable, the, the service this person was selling. And when I said, okay, well, look, this, I'm not ready for, you know, for that. The person when, well, it, when they start, then they start questioning me, which I don't mind. It's okay to you know to to be questioned, but she's sort of questioning. Yeah, maybe you don't feel you're worthy of this, or maybe you know. Uh, and the person was saying, you know, what well, I've asked, I've asked people for money. You know, I've got loads of stuff given to me. She says, and I was like, and she said, well, maybe you should ask, or maybe you could take a loan, maybe you could just ask your friends uh-huh. or family. Classic. And I was like, yeah, and I was just like. That, that would be a decision I would need to make. First of all, it's a personal decision. You know, whatever you want to decide, that's down to you. But I was, like, <laughs> I was like, wait a minute. I was like, so you, that person has no scruples in asking someone to, who don't have, one, maybe doesn't feel the, the service is worth that amount of money. Or two, it could just be that person doesn't have the money, is asking you to go and ask people for money. I mean, I don't know. I just always find that always big alarm bells to me. Well, there's two interesting things here. Number one, this is definitely a hand-me-down copycat sales strategy that people have been teaching for decades, if not centuries, right? Um, But when somebody, somebody learned in a sales training, you know, just to overcome the objection of, I don't have the money no matter what. But when... It's interesting that when they're saying to you, oh, if you really cared or if you really believed in yourself or you really thought you deserved this or you're really ready to take your business to the next level, you'd figure it out. Yeah. What they're actually saying is, I don't believe in my business enough to let go of the leads that aren't the right fit. So I'm so insecure about my own revenue that I am going to chase every lead, even the ones that are inappropriate for what I'm doing. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. So that's the flip side of that. Anytime somebody does that to you and they, and because they can be really manipulative about making you feel Mm. like you're not good enough. You need to remember it's them who feels like they're not good enough in that moment. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's really in bad taste because I think if you do have a call with someone and you talk about private stuff or whatever, that person is in a open, open state, a vulnerable state. And then you just go and then go, well, you know, and, and then you do that, do that trick. It's like, whoo, it's so, someone who, you know, I, I'm just thinking, you know, for people who come across that, who aren't, who maybe would then go and believe and then go and ask people and ask their friends for money, you know, because I'm sure if that person has well, that it line, work. it must work. Yeah. That's why people advocate this sales strategy. You're right. Yeah, so it's yeah. that's very predatory. And this is one of the reasons I created my show is because, yeah. you know, yeah, I want to help people, but I also, speaking of being polarizing, want to call out this bullshit. Yeah. I, can I say bullshit, Angie? Yeah. Oh, yeah. You can. Yeah. No, yeah. Yeah. I mean, the show's called, cool. there's this shit in the title. So you're fine. You oh, yeah. Totally yeah. Cuss. Um, <laughs> you can totally cuss. But, you know, the other thing that I think is interesting about this is that, and this is, One of the ways I think I'm really uh, kind of bucking the trends of my industry and taking a risk, this is probably the scariest risk to take, to be quite honest with you, Mm -hmm. is that when it comes to, you know, I do branding, marketing, web design, content. Those are the things that my agency focuses on. None of these things, none of the things that I offer could I guarantee like a, a specific ROI on. Yeah. Because all every single one of those things hinges on a hundred other factors. And this is the biggest lie that I feel like marketers are telling. There's no way that anyone, whether they're doing Facebook ads or copywriting or brand design or content or market, can guarantee if you hire me, I can get you X, Y results. You know what I'm saying? In fact, yeah. I would say the only exception to this would be 
if you are working with an existing company that is already thriving, you can be pretty sure that unless you totally mess it up, they will see results from what you help them with because they're already going to be successful no matter what. And that's what I've kind of found in this marketing space is that there's nothing that I can do that's going to magically make someone who isn't poised for success already successful, right? So whenever yeah, I'm on a sales yeah. page and it's like, thanks to blah, 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 I made a th- I had a $350,000 launch. That's not true. Yeah. Okay. That yeah. is, that testimonial is not accurate. Maybe the person feels that way because yeah, they needed to delegate. They needed another t- person to take this off of their hands. But the reality is it wasn't that copy that did it. It wasn't that design that did it. It was all these, this confluence of factors. And this is the number one thing that I think um, most people in this industry don't want to admit that I cannot save you if you're not already on the track to be successful. Now, there's certain things I can do to improve and to accelerate your results. But if you are not, I mean, if you're not, if you're destined to fail, and I hate to say that, but the the reality is that what percentage of small businesses fail um, a big amount, you know, as well as the US. Yeah. Not everyone is going to succeed. This is capitalism. It sucks. But if there's nothing that I can do to rescue you from that fate, if you're not, if you don't have all these other kind of factors in place. So yeah. that's the, that's the tricky thing. And that's always been the tricky thing about when I'm selling to someone. Um, and that's why in my own process, I bake in a ton of strategy. If I, even if I'm just doing a logo design for someone, we're going to talk about your business strategy, your marketing strategy, and how you're going to make this logo really work for you beyond how pretty it looks. Because I can't in good faith just design pretty things for people that on its own is not going to be a boomerang. Like, you know, you throw that money out there and then it comes right back and whacks you in the face. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Oh yeah. No, I just, it's quite, and I, I wish actually more people would say what you're saying because especially when, when we start out, we don't know, we will, you know, a lot of us are out there trying to look for a magic pill. Oh, how do I get more eyes on the website? How do I write better copy? You know, all of this stuff. And I think, Also, this is what I have realized. I mean, for me to find the right people to work with, it always takes me forever because it's never just the one thing that makes any business successful. Like good people are like gold dust. If you can get like an amazing team, that's amazing. But everyone works together. It's like a building block. And it's all these little things put together. If you can... As a business owner, if you can have the vision, seeing what you want, and you can get the people and you can get, tell them how you want it to put together, a bit like when you direct a movie, then that's where magic happens because it's not in isolation. All of these things don't work in a vacuum. Like you said, doing a logo, a branding does not guarantee you success. It depends on so many other things like, you know, consistency, you know, are you destined to fail or not? Like, you know, what would you have behind it? What's the substance, right? Yeah. And I hate to use that phrase destined just to fail. Um, because I know why <laughs> I like, I, you know, somebody's listening to this. So like, wait a minute, is that me? But I mean, that is the reality. And this is why if you're a small business owner, I think a lot of small business owners, I see them coming into this world and they immediately want to delegate marketing. And that's the last thing they should be delegating. Uh, you know, a lot of small business owners are scared of marketing. They feel uncomfortable marketing, but they've got small budgets. So they go out and they hire somebody that's going to do their Facebook for $200 a month or write their copy for a few hundred bucks or design their website for less than a thousand dollars, you know, because they want to get it off their plate and they're insecure about doing this. And this is not a skill they want to develop. But when you're a small business owner with a small budget, the best person to do your marketing is you. And this is, this is, I'm not the first person to say this. Marie Forleo talks about this all the time marketing is a skill set as a small business owner, you have to develop. And this is, you know, pay hard. This is like, you know, tough love here that I'm saying, but when you're in those early phases and you don't have the money to invest in a true pro, you have to become the pro. And yeah. that's how you, you know, that's how you position your company and your business for success. Like how do you avoid being destined to fail? You've got to become a marketer. That's, that's the truth. And I think a lot of people fail because they don't want to accept that. So they'll just hire these things out to somebody that is not doing a good job because they're not Mm. getting paid enough to do a good job. That's the truth. 
you yeah. know and also so, they don't really they may not you may not have enough content out there for someone to even understand what you're about so how can they do the marketing for you exactly oh my gosh I can't even tell you how many times I've yeah. had people come to me saying okay I hired this Facebook company to do my social media and then all the content was garbage but it's like but you don't have any content and yeah. you don't know what your business is all about and you're not <laughs> sure what parts of your message resonate with your audience how do you expect yeah. some you know cheap upwork company to do that for you for less than $500 a month, you know? Yeah, 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 yeah absolutely. How, so when you say you have to do your marketing, are you talking about like writing emails, like a newsletter, posting on social media, or is it something else you talk about? Yes, all of the above. I, I do think that before you delegate these things, I always like to say, delegate only what you yourself have mastered or you can afford to pay someone to master for you. So masters of marketing are not cheap. That's the truth. You're not going to find some two penny, you know, copywriter on a Facebook group for beginning businesses who's going to be able to make magic happen for you. So if you are not yet at the point that you have the revenue to to bring in a master and an expert of their trade to do this work for you, then you have to become the master. And so, yes, all of the above, social media, content, emails. And I think this is because the internet has made it so easy for people to start a business I think people get irritated when they discover that they have to learn these skills. But this is <laughs> any successful small business owner today is successful because they have to the best of their abilities develop, like work their marketing muscle and learn how to be a good marketer. And then when they have validated the concept of their business and they've got, you know, a healthy revenue coming in, then they delegate it, right? Then they're able to pass it off their plate. But first, you know, you're going to have to learn how to market, master these skills. And luckily there's a show called Awkward Marketing. That yes. Can you some of the things. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. And, but you know, so actually one thing that you said that is that I, I also believe that as, unless you know how to have some understanding of that skill, you will never know if when you pass it on, if that person is doing a good job or not. And you're yes. not going to know. Yeah. You're not going to be able to appreciate the good ones or know when you're being duped. Because I love writing, but this is also why I know who's a good, I can tell who's a good copywriter, you know, and they also know how to adapt and they bring so much value. I mean, someone like Jen Wyndham, for example, she's fantastic. Love Uh, her. Obsession 11, check her out. Check her out. Yeah. Exactly. And, And this is why I tell, like, when I have a new brand new business owner come to me for a website, I... Like 99% of the time, I'm going to tell you, you should design your first website because it also helps you to start, you know, shaping your brain around how to fit these things together. And as you said, when you're ready to hire and you're really, and you have the revenue to justify that investment, you'll know what to look for. You'll know who is an expert and who's not. So a hundred thousand million bazillion percent, I agree with you. Mm. And also, I think it'll make you feel also less, um, you don't feel weird about giving away your money. You're just like, actually, yes. um, this is peace of mind. I'm very happy to pay you, <laughs> you know, it's just, you've got it. So I think all the things like they almost like it all comes together at some point where you go, yeah, and actually no, yeah, it's totally worth giving you X amount of money. Exactly. And that's how exactly. it is. So I want to know, because in terms of all these characters, are there any particular spaces where you get your inspirations from? There's a thing called online, like, you know, you have the hate likes, people who like, like, but they uh-huh. hate, you have yeah. the hate follows. And, yeah. but there's also the inspire follows. And by inspire follows, I mean, like those people show you like what not to do. Like there are yeah. some accounts that look like I follow, like a, in terms of like women health and stuff. And I'm like, oh my God, I can't believe they're saying this. And it's inspiration for me to then go, wait uh-huh. a minute, you guys, this is the bullshit that's happening. I don't, I don't name the person, but right. I'm like, it helps me figure out, oh, that's what's happening. So do you have like, one, where do you get your inspirations from? And two, do you have any inspire follow? You don't have to name them if you don't want to. Yeah. So I, I do like to say that my best content comes from the stuff that pisses me off. Like yes. That's where all of my content comes from. I agree. And, yeah. But I like to say people, I'll say this to people and they'll be like, so wait a minute, you're out there just creating all this angry content. No, 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 no. Anytime I see something in my industry that is irritating me, or maybe sometimes it's a thing that a client does that I'm like, oh, I'm sick of this. Then a little bell goes off in my brain where I'm like, oh, whoa, 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 wait a minute. This is just pointing me in the direction of content that I need to create. This is something my industry needs to hear. This is a place where I can make change and be a positive impact on people who are doing what I'm, you know, doing. 
And so I will then take my frustration and turn it into something useful and positive and not just like a rant on Facebook, where I go on Facebook, you know what? I'm sick of this. Like, no, I hate that. <laughs> yeah. I hate that crap. So yeah, uh, I, I do hate follow slash inspire follow a lot of people. In fact, my feed is just full of the most garbage marketing because I click on all of it so that I can research it. You know what yeah, I'm saying? Yeah. I am like getting retargeted by the worst of the worst, but I love it. I'm like, yes, this is great. Um, and now it's gotten to the point with my show where people will send me Like they'll send me their Brad's, for example, like Brad, Oh, nice! you know, just a symbol now for that douchey, sleazy, manipulative bullshit marketer. Right. So people will be like, oh my God, I saw this ad. It's such a Brad and they'll send it to me. So that's the best. I love that. So yeah, I, I follow dozens of people who make their way onto the show, not by name, anytime (laughs) I meet someone it's because I'm going to pay tribute to them. I'm not going to, you know, call them out. Um, yeah, yeah. No, I agree. I agree with so, that. So yeah, mm-hmm. totally. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 No, definitely. Yeah. I, um, yeah, I don't believe in the whole name and shaming thing. I think it's ridiculous. And I think often those people don't even know that's who you're talking about. You're they correct. Don't see, they don't see themselves as that. <laughs> no, it's so funny. I have done things before. And then the person who I was kind of thinking of has been like, Oh, this is hilarious. And I'm like, Oh (laughs) my God. Okay. (laughs) This is good. Um, But yeah, you know what, this is uh, what you were saying about if you see something and it makes you angry or annoyed or the other marketeers do or clients or something. And what you you said, like, this is pointing you in the direction of a, this is what you need to, you need to create content around that. I love that. I'm going to remember this now. Yes. Yeah, this is great because it's just pointing you in the direction. It's a much nicer way of looking at it, actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's what it's doing is this is kind of the crux of what I call reverse niching. It, you know, a lot of times when we're thinking about our niche, we um, we go at it from like, who's my ideal client? What do I stand for? But sometimes that can be really challenging. And so one of the ways I like to back into that is to say, okay, what are you? What do you absolutely hate that people do in your industry? What would you never get caught dead doing? Who will you never work with? And when you go through that side of things, it's like a backdoor way of getting to your brand values. Because if I see something in my industry that frustrates me, that is, is showing me what I value and what I want to make my business about. So just like we were saying, those like salespeople who will guilt trip you into buying their program or like taking out a loan or asking a friend for money, I have now created a whole sales approach, which is the exact opposite of that because it's re it's made me see, Oh wait, my values are to be honest and to be in integrity and to, to turn people away when I know they're going to be wasting their money. That's now my value. And so that's kind of where you can take the things that frustrate you and, and turn them into something constructive. And, and that's where you find your brand values. Yeah. And it's also how you build respect by turning people away that you know can't. Exactly. You know, they're not a right fit because then the day if they become a right fit, they will come to you. They'll remember that you are actually the honest one in the sea of, right. you know, sleazy ones. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So because your videos, they look quite like quite advanced. Like it's, I mean, you make it look easy, but I know that they, they're not easy to make. Like, do you do it all yourself or do you have a team? I like, do it all myself. I have a team wow. that I work with in my agency, but for video, it's me, baby. It's all me. Wow. Did you, did you learn this um, just as you went? Yes. Wow. Okay, and that's yeah, what yeah. I recommend for people. Like, I started with crappy Facebook Live videos, like really bad in a lot of ways. And... Every week I would just layer on one new thing that I was going to learn. Like I, you know, this week I'm going to improve my sound and next week I'm going to work on my SEO and next week I'm going to work on my cover photo. And that's how I've kind of gone. And if you look back to the earliest episodes of Awkward Marketing, you will see a big difference in the quality, but that's how you got it. Especially if you are a small business owner, you've just got to be willing to get out there and be your sloppy, imperfect self and challenge yourself every time you put out a piece of content. I'm just going to improve one little thing about it. And the show has transformed in the last two years because I've done that instead of waiting until I was perfect to put mm. it out there. Yeah, no, absolutely. The, the, how long has it been now you've made the, you've made the videos? The so open marketing? I guess it's been about two and a half years since I started the live show and then two years since I started doing the comedy show. And the comedy show, that's the awkward marketing videos you're yeah, talking about. Yeah, that's the awkward yeah. marketing we know and love today. Yes. But that's gone by quickly. And yeah, yeah and now it's just like completely, shoo. Like, yeah, it's, it's huge now. So yeah, this is amazing. It's, it's, it's great. I'm just really excited. I'm happy to, to see that and watch your, 
what's your success? I want to talk about like how you still make time for your own life, like outside of business. Because I know you have a baby and I don't know if I'm allowed to say that. Yeah, you're allowed yeah, to say okay. that. Because <laughs> it's private. But yeah, so how do you, how do you make time like to, oh, for your man. business and, and your personal life? If you have. Well, I'm going to be real with you. I'm not going to sugarcoat this. I work a lot. That's yeah. the truth. I think there's these two polar extremes where on one side we have hustle culture, which is very Gary Vee, like hustle, hustle all the time, all the time. And that's glamorized. But then on the other side of that, we have like relaxation culture where it's like, if you're working more than four hours a week, you're a fool. <laughs> what are you doing? You yeah. haven't figured out the secret yet. Um, you know, I'm in a place in my business where I'm transitioning. So I've got an agency that's very healthy and going really well, but I'm growing this personal brand. I'm moving into speaking. I'm growing the show. So that kind of means like I have two businesses in a way, you yeah. know, like I've oh, got yeah. the business that's paying. I, it's like my, it's like awkward marketing slash my speaking career is a side hustle at this point because it's not paying the majority of my bills. So it does mean that I am putting in the time now playing the long game. Um, and I do, I do spend a lot of time working, but here's the other side of that. My husband is a stay at home dad. He's incredible. He's amazing. The man, he is just like makes the magic happen. Yeah. Oh yeah. And so I, you know, get to spend a lot of time with my daughter. I do work from home quite a bit. Um, I used to work from home less, but once I had a baby, it just made sense for me to be here because then I can pop up into my daughter's nursery at two in the afternoon and play with her for, you know, a half an hour. And I'm there when she wakes up and I'm there, you know, all throughout the day. And so uh, that is the blessing and the curse of being an entrepreneur is you work all the time, but also that you, you own your own time. Um, and so I fit in the, the pleasure all throughout my day and that's kind of how we're making it work right now. But I'm not going to lie and say, oh, you know, I, I only work a 25 hour work week and then I spend the rest of the time like sipping a margarita in a hammock. No, I work a lot. And sometimes like that's what I've decided is important at this point. And, you know, speaking of the, the, you know, the title of this podcast, I only have, I feel like, you know, you know, a certain amount of time in my youth, if you will, to bust it out this hard. And then in 10 years, I do want to be working a 25 hour work, you know, so I'm paying my dues now for my, I'm giving my future self this gift of working hard now. Yeah. It's a gamble. Everything is a gamble. I don't think I am, but people say I work a lot. And when I date, they always said, you always work this hard. And I'm like, I guess I have, I have to be careful and I have to also make sure I make time for, like you said, like the pleasures, you know, so make sure I'm social. So I'm being more careful about it now. It's not healthy. You know, when you work for yourself, you buy yourself a lot of time, you know, and often if you do have someone working with you, they're remote, you know, they're, it's, it's an online world now. So yeah. It's making sure <laughs> that, you know, don't become like a recluse. So definitely, I think it's important because when we're passionate about what we do, it's easy to just put in the time. But, and I think, yeah, but the idea obviously is to have a quality of life at some point that you don't have to be doing all these hours because things will start to leverage up. Well, here's the other thing, Angie. It didn't, I wasn't always this way because I don't believe in the whole like, you know, do, li, do what you love and you'll never work a day in your life. I think that's a really <laughs> privileged kind of narrow view and not everyone has that luxury. And it took me a long time to get here because, you know, for all the reasons I said before, but awkward marketing is a lot of time, a ton of time. Like you don't want to know, like, I don't even know how to quantify it, how much time I put into the show. And yet the reality is this is my creative outlet as well. Like yes. I love doing this show. It is, I, I get to be a performer. I get to be a designer, a producer, a director, an editor, a sound designer, a costume designer. I do all those things with the show. So I have found a way to bring in, you know, one of my passions and my hobby into the business. So even though it is work and it's a lot of work, when I'm working on awkward marketing, that's like, I feel as though I am pampering myself doing that show. And so that kind of makes it a little bit more, a little less painful, you know? Yeah. No, I, no and it's so true. I think this is why... Well, I don't realize that I'm working. Like people say to me, "Are you work? Are you always working so hard? You're always working hard." Uh, to me, I feel like I'm not working hard enough sometimes. <laughs> but it's like it's because I love what I do. It is a creative outlet. Like I've managed to turn it into a creative outlet. I think if I hated what I, I wouldn't be able to work this hard for exactly. a day job. Exactly. I wouldn't be able to do a full time. I wouldn't be able to do six days a week for someone else. Never. Mm -hmm. Never again. I have done, but I never agree. again. So 
were you, I'm just curious, were, were you always an entrepreneur when you had your, your, your now husband? Like, was he all, like, he knew what he got himself into? <laughs> uh, yes, yes, he did. And I, if, if it's even possible, I worked more than actually having my baby has given me built in downtime in a way that I didn't have when we, mm. when I first met my husband. But yeah, uh, when I met my husband, yes, I had the business and, but I wasn't always an entrepreneur. I, in fact, I didn't want to be an entrepreneur. I kind of stumbled into this. Like a lot of people are like, oh, you know, I quit my job so I could pursue my dream of running a business. I did not do that. I moved to Southern Mexico and spent eight years there. And the reason I started my business was to fund the nonprofit work I was doing down there. It was truly a means to an end. I did not care about my business. It was only a way to pay the bills. And then over the years of doing it, I kind of fell in love with it. So yeah, I mean, I didn't start out to be an entrepreneur. This was not my dream, not at all. And yet I kind of fell in love with it. It was like a beautiful surprise. Wow. I think this is great. I think it's great that he's like, that you've managed to find someone that works, he works well with. I think if you were both as busy and having a baby will be, it, it makes it really, it's, it's a different challenge, right? Yeah. So I think this is nice. No, is wonderful. Oh, we're going to go to the next thing, but I'm just curious because you said you were doing some volunteer work in South Mexico. Can I ask what you were doing? Yeah. So I ran a theater troupe with young women using theater as a tool for community education and change making. And so I was teaching a specific style of theater where you use theater as a way of exploring the ways you want to make change in your community. And so that's what I was doing down there. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I think I've heard about that. It's got, I think it's got a name. I can't remember now, but yeah, I've heard, I've heard about something like that before where it's yeah theater, but for, it's almost like a social enterprise, but using yeah. theater. Yeah. As a mean. Yeah. Okay. So I want to do a little game with you where I just drop some names of people who are huge in marketing in different industries and then also a show. And so it'll just be like a fiery round and you just say whatever comes to your mind, you can do it as yourself or in characters. Okay. Uh Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. So what are your thoughts on Mary Folio? Um, She's my best friend, actually. We are really tight. So, um, (laughs) We talk every day and, you know, I, I couldn't, I couldn't do what I do without her. I'm kidding. JK, <laughs> she's a legend, untouchable. Everyone wants to be Marie Forleo's best friend. Next one, Chris Jenner. Chris Jenner, I'm actually doing a spinoff show called Awkward Momming and she's going to be the first character. So, yeah. <gasps> oh my God. Okay. When is the spinoff show coming? Um, tomorrow. It's coming out. Seriously? I'm totally JK, Angie. I am not doing this, <laughs> but if I was to do it. She'd be the first one. I know. <laughs> okay. Um, you, you, you should do a quick momming in business. So, um, Gary V. Okay. I think he's sexy. I, I got to no, be real with really? you. I don't know what it is, but lately I have, have, I, I have like a crush on Gary V. It just happened to me. So, yeah. Don't tell my husband. Do you know, I think he'd be giving a lot of angry sex because he looks so angry. I'm into it. Time. You know what? Yeah, I right? use that. what? He's the polar <laughs> opposite of my husband. Maybe that's it. But. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You need, you need something different. What about Tony Robbins? You know, Tony Robbins is a masterful salesperson. I think Tony Robbins' best work was in the movie Shallow Howl, which is a horrible movie. So uh, <laughs> that's all I'll say about that. Uh, Tim Ferriss. You know what? Tim Ferriss is the guy I want to be stuck on a desert island with because he would get us out in four hours or less, you know? (laughs) Okay. Uh, uh, I hope I pronounced his name right. Jay Shetty. Dude, I I have to Google this name. I actually, I know I'm not cool. I don't know who the heck that is. I really do not. Sorry, Jay. Love you. (laughs) Don't know her. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. Seth Godin. He's the king. I love me some Seth. I have nothing snarky or funny to say about him. I, I love Seth. What about Sex in the City, the show? Sex in the City is like an awkward time capsule. You know, we can look back on how far we've come as women. I mean, like, listen, it's, an, it's entertaining. But when you look at back at Sex in the City with the 2020 eyes, you're like, oh, uh, what were we thinking? <laughs> so awkward time capsule. That's Sex in the City. Okay, thank you so much for that. That was really good. That was really, really good. Um, so to keep in the spirit of the podcast, I'm going to have two more questions for you. What do you wish you knew or were told when you were 18? I wish I had been told to not fake it. 
during sex. That's, that's the number one thing. <laughs> because here, and then I'm going to relate this back to business because number yeah. one, when you think that you're doing yourself a disservice, but you're really doing a disservice to all other women or sexual beings, because you're teaching this person you're with that they're good mm-hmm. when they're not. Yeah. And it's kind of like when you're a business owner and you uh, like you lowball your own prices and then you're undercutting your industry. Like, don't do that. You're hurting everyone. And I was only, I was hurting myself and everyone else by faith. So it's like, girl, just own what you need to get off. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree a hundred percent. And what shit are you too old for now? <laughs> you know what I'm too old for? Staying in hostels. I lived in Mexico for eight years. I stayed in the crappiest, like, spider-infested dens in the name of frugality. I'm over frugality in those ways, you know? (laughs) Like, I would buy the generic brand of detergent, but I am not staying in a freaking youth hostel ever again in my entire life. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, I've done them too. Okay, so look, this has been absolutely wonderful, Rachel. Thank you so much. Is there... Anything before I ask where where people can find you? Is there anything you feel that you want to add that we may maybe we haven't talked about? You know what I like to tell people who are building their brands and starting to create content for themselves is a lot of people are nervous. Like, oh my gosh, what can I say that hasn't already been said? And if you're wondering this, you're right. You can't say anything that it's already been that hasn't been said. Everything's been said. But if you look at the show Awkward Marketing. I am not inventing any marketing knowledge that isn't already out there. It's more important how you say your message than what you're saying. So, you know, you've got a unique perspective. You've got a unique contribution, just like you, Angie, in the health industry. Like you're not inventing anything here, but your approach is inventive. And that's the most important thing. You don't need to worry about creating something that hasn't been, you know, creating something brand new. It's really about contributing your voice to the conversation and saying it differently, not saying something different. Absolutely agree. Absolutely agree. Yeah. Thank you so much for this, Rachel. Thank you. You're a queen. You're you're my everything. (laughs) I wish I was a queen. Uh, No. Where can can people find you? Well, you got to head over to awkwardmarketing.tv. Uh, and subscribe to the show on YouTube. I haven't been pushing YouTube hard enough, so I'm pushing it today. I'm a YouTube pusher, Angie. And (laughs) if you are in a position where you're thinking of doing like a brand design, you want to hire a designer, you want to hire a marketing team, I'm going to encourage you to go to don'thireawebdesigner.com because I've got a guide for people that they need to look at before they make that investment. All the things we were talking about today, making an investment in these things, before you lay down that coin, Go check out my guide, don't hire a web designer.com. Is that that's your website? Don't hire a web designer. That's my that's the site for my ebook. Yeah. I love it. This is great. <laughs> that's it. Well, thank you so much for the, for this. And yeah, have a have a lo- uh, lovely day. You too. I'll talk to you later, girl. And that's our episode. I hope you enjoyed it. Please don't forget to rate, review, subscribe on iTunes, follow on Spotify, and whichever way the other platforms let you show love, please do it. That's how you can support this show. Drop me your questions or suggestions for future episodes via the website at angie-s.com or find me on Instagram. I have two accounts. One is tool for the shit podcast and the other one is health lifestylist. Links in the show notes. See you next week. And until then, is it health? Inappropriate thing.